classes if you weren't able to make um, from the ones we've had. We had Nina Perla last week and Lorna McGee as well. Um, so those are going to be, those are up on our uh, YouTube uh, channel and also today's will be as well. Um, okay, everything good there, Dustin, on your end then? Are you all set? Okay, great. Um, so today's class is on extended techniques. And one of the ways I thought um, we would approach this is not just how to do them or what they are, but um, how to teach them. Um, because that's really challenging, you know? I, I think uh, once you've done extended techniques a lot on your own and you've grappled with it and you've helped students grapple with it, you, you develop a language for teaching it, but if, if you haven't had a lot of experience with that, then how do you teach, how do you even start? How do you start dealing with um, a student who can't sing and play? Like what are the pitfalls and, and how do you navigate them? And so that's kind of like what the class will also be like. And also I really would um, very much encourage everybody to kind of raise their hands um, and interrupt to ask questions along the way. I would like for this class to be more interactive than me just, you know, spouting off <laughs> whatever wisdom I've gained from teaching this topic and, and performing with it. Um, so please just kind of jump in. And what I'm gonna do is share my screen right now and show you the format of today's class. Um, so if I can figure this out here, okay. So basically, here are the notes for how we're going to run the class today. So we're going to talk a little bit about, um, uh, and, and if you have your flutes, by the way, please do take them out because you'll enjoy trying these things out. We won't listen to you do that, but we'll, you might be wanting to try some things out. So we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what are extended techniques? Why do composers use them? Like, what's the value of them? Um, and then we'll break it down and um, talk about you know, how to do them. And at that point, if, if you'd like to in, sort of interject and say, hey, I've never done any of this before. I'm curious about, you know, your experience with X, Y, and Z, then that's where I really invite people to jump in. Um, our studio is pretty active with, um, you know, embracing this repertoire. And we even have freshmen who um, start with this kind of music, but typically, it's kind of shunned. It's kind of viewed as like, well, you, you shouldn't really move into extended techniques until you've mastered the Ebert concerto. And then maybe, maybe you can play Density 21.5, which has key clicks, blah, right? So there's a sort of like um, tradition of kind of placing them on hold. And I just want to start off by saying, I don't embrace that and I don't think we should as flute players because if you think about it, extended techniques are truly, first of all, they shouldn't even be named extended techniques in my opinion. They are just language. The, of any sound the flute makes is something that should be taught. Hey Dustin, can you make sure everybody's muted please? Um, so the idea is if you're teaching beginners, like even five-year-olds or seven-year-olds, I encourage you not to hold off on the extended techniques because actually, and kind of um, comically, most of them are already making sounds that are extended technique sounds, right? And that's kind of exciting. So you can just kind of say to like little Sally who happens to go, you can say, wow, I liked your breath noise. Did you know that you can actually do the breath noise on purpose and you can name it? Like that is a breathy tone. And is a breathy tone bad? It's not bad. It's, it's a color, it's a sound, it's an experience. It's a way of navigating music. And did you know composers are actually putting breathy tones in things? And so you can have that kind of discussion and then take that student on a journey through a spectrum so that you're not just always hammering out, your tone has to be super clear, it has to be exactly like this, but you're over here on the spectrum, you're at one in terms of tonal clarity, and now I wanna hear a 10, great, let me hear one again. And so they never lose that uh, natural ability to kind of make whatever sounds they want on the flute. And beatboxing, 
um, or unofficially beatboxing, any kind of vocal percussion is great to do with kids. Like Mary had a little lamb, you know, or even chop. Most of them can do that. Key clicks, we all do key clicks. We've all been doing it, you know, since uh, we sat in band or whatever at the age of fifth grade and up and the conductor was, you know, talking to the clarinets or whoever and, and you're there key clicking along and you're kind of making it a little bit loud so you can hear what you're playing. So that doesn't, that shouldn't disappear from our vocabulary. So the first thing is to um, embrace a concept that extended techniques are not something to be pushed off into the way distant. And if you're a teacher, I hope this class will be inspiring for that. And if, if you're not a teacher and we're just the WVU students here, please remember this. And that's why in a studio, we, we do this from the beginning. We don't shove it off until you're a master's or a doctoral student, okay? So, um, and again, anytime you want to question, just I'm going to have Dustin keep his eye open because I can't actually see everybody here as I'm going through this. So we're going to talk about, um, <clears throat> you know, what they are, <clears throat> why are they used, and some of the hurdles. Um, and then we'll go into different kinds of sounds. And I don't know that we're going to get into all of these, depends on the timing. But um, I, what I have on my list is wind sounds, key clicks, timbre tr trills, lip bends. We might try to get to the hardest ones first. That way, um, if you're wondering, how do I teach a jet whistle or how do I do a jet whistle? We, we don't end up missing it in today's class because I think that's really important. Um, tongue pizzicato, flutter tonguing. You know, there, there are a couple kinds of flutter tonguing we can talk about troubleshooting with students who really struggle with it, um, whistle tones, harmonics. So when we get to this list, or even if you have a list in your own head, I want you to write that down right now. Like here's, here's one I really would like Professor C. Macopoulos to cover, um, or here are the questions I have, or here's what I'm struggling with with myself or my student. And then at that point, I'll open it up and maybe we'll organize how we move through these dependent on what you as a as a group would like to hear. So um, the first thing I wanted to do was pull up the score um, of Maggie Payne's reflections. And I want to talk about how scary music like this can look. Um, see if I can move things around here. Okay, so this is Reflections by Maggie Payne. And I would say that this is probably the first hurdle that we encounter um, as flutists, especially if we don't have a history of navigating extended techniques. And that is mainly that it looks so different on the page. I would even go as far as to say it looks petrifying. And I'm laughing because I've heard people use that word and I know I've thought it myself. Here's another, here's another page from the same piece. And so I think one of the hardest hurdles in terms of navigating pieces with extended techniques is first off what it looks like on the page. And if you don't have a mentor or someone to kind of hold your hand and go, all right, we're going to work through this together. Um, you know, this is what this means, this is what this means, then what can happen is the task can become daunting. And unless you have a lot of time to dedicate to it, you might give up. Because uh, navigating a score like this is a time consuming task. How do you go about doing it? Let's say you don't have a mentor, somebody you're taking lessons with, and you're trying to learn a piece. Well, the first thing is normally these, these, uh, all of these pieces have a page with a key, and I don't have that pulled up here, um, but basically the key will say, the X means use a whistle tone, the triangle means use this, the, the plus means key click, okay? And a lot of uh, composers, because this isn't, uh, the language is not yet internationalized, a lot of composers cross um, cross the symbols. So you might have one composer who uses triangles on the line for 
a, a, like a whistle tone. And you might have another composer who uses a square like this. And this means like pitched air glyphs, but maybe they don't write pitched air glyphs. And so you're looking at the square and you're like, well, what, you know, what does the square mean? I see that you raise your hand, Juan. So when I pause, I'm gonna have Dustin kind of uh, uh, moderate the questions. Um, <clears throat> so the first issue is that we're, we're dealing with um, new sounds that don't have a standardized international vocabulary. And that can be really tricky. Um, not every composer who uses extended techniques is good at explaining what they want you to do. Um, and that's hard to believe because it's like, well, this piece is published, it's, it's made by a composer. Therefore, it must be right and it must be clear and I must be the one in the wrong. And so the other thing to realize is it's probably not the case. I mean, they're learning, we're learning. In the case of Maggie Payne, she's a flutist and she's also a composer who's extremely clear. So this is a beautiful manuscript. Everything is just precisely described. She says here, for example, hum slightly off pitch while playing C4, while, while still playing C4, hum a gliss, go as high or low as possible, emphasize difference tones. This is very unusual. It's not common that you see this kind of specificity. So the second part of that would be to say that get in touch with the composer if you don't have a mentor who's studied the piece and knows exactly what a square might mean. In some cases, the uh, key the first page that gives you the like the description of what you're supposed to do is actually missing things that happens too. Uh, so get in touch with the composer, you know, find them on Facebook, message them um, and say, hey, I don't understand what this means. Could you clarify? Uh, but that's what, what I'd say the first hurdle is this sort of approach to navigating the score. And I'll pause now to take any questions. Have yeah, so um, Sammy put in the chat, what are your top three favorite extended technique pieces to use it to introduce students to these concepts? Great, I love the question. Thank you, Sammy. So I think my first favorite one is The Great Train Race by Ian Clark. It's one that looks scary. So the student gets like that, that blast of fear and then you kind of hold their hand and then all of a sudden, after you've kind of gone through it and said, well, this is just this and this is this, after they've had a week to kind of soak it in and, and look it over, the sense of accomplishment is quite, quite exciting because suddenly it's like, wow, that looked really scary and here I am doing it. In fact, we have a couple of students in the room who've done it and I'd like to hear from you starting with um, maybe JC, I don't see you, but I know you're here somewhere. Can you speak a little bit to like what it was like for you when you first saw the great train race and, and then how you felt in terms of accomplishment? Um, yeah, I remember I tried learning the great train race before I even came to WVU. Um, my high school flute teacher didn't do a ton of the extended techniques. So I remember trying to kind of learn it on my own and I just felt so overwhelmed because I didn't know what any of the symbols men or anything so i kind of came into learning it with this view in mind that it was super complicated and hard um and then when i started working on it i was really overwhelmed at first but within a lesson or two um, i found out that it really didn't take a long time to break everything down because a lot of it was really repetitive anyway um, and so once i learned one thing um, or one technique, I basically had like half the piece learned already. Um, so that was really encouraging for me to find out that it looks really complicated, but really it's just the same couple things over and over. So you can learn the whole piece basically in like one lesson. Yeah, and I think we probably did. We drafted it in one lesson. So um, something that JC said made me think that another, another thing we do that is really helpful is to create a key. So your own version of a key. So you would go through the piece and, and then I will answer Sammy's question with two more pieces that I recommend. Um, so Dustin, keep me on track here if I forget to do that. But um, one thing that's really great to do, and if you're learning like Lookout by Robert Dick or Charanga, 
This is especially good because those pieces look so overwhelming. Like look out is 12 pages long, I think, <clears throat> even though the font size is like 102 or whatever he uses. But the thing is like, you have all these multiphonics and all these fingerings, like, like fingerings like this, for example, here in Maggie Payne's piece. And if you're not looking for how often they occur, it's going to really look overwhelming. But if you take a moment, not a moment, if you take an hour or two to study the score and analyze it and be like, oh, this is a section, this is a section, take a magic marker. These are photocopies, of course. Put every section into a different color, which makes it feel more uh, manageable. It's more fun for the student. It's more fun for you. And then create a key. Wow, this is the same multiphonic as in these five other spots. Okay, I'm going to take a green magic marker. I'm going to put a box around all of the multiphonics that are this. And then I'm taking all of that. I'm putting it on a piece of white paper. I'm going to mark this multiphonic and I'm going to say this is green and then do it with another one and another one. And then often like in Lookout, you'll find that there are only like four multiphonics or whatever in the whole piece, but it looks, or even Chiranga, but it looks like it's like 50. And so suddenly, again, it makes it more manageable. And you're now looking at a score that's been dissected and you're starting to like put the puzzle pieces together. Like when you make a puzzle, you put all the edges in a corner, you put the corners, and then you gather all the oranges, you gather all the greens, and suddenly you start to be able to make your puzzle. Um, so marking the score, creating a key, and then having on that one piece of paper all the things you actually need to know in terms of extended techniques for the piece, writing the timbral trills in, or just photocopying it and cutting it out and pasting it all to a piece of paper. Um, in terms of other pieces, so Great Train Race, I think, is my all-time favorite one to start with. Um, and it introduces techniques that are really important to learn, like singing and playing and, and other things that are not too difficult to learn. And um, I think Beverly by Ian Clark is another really good one because, um, and I know Jacob, I think that was our first one, right, Jacob? Are you? Yes, it was. Yeah, what was that like for you when you started Beverly? Um, for me, it was definitely different, um, but it was very approachable. Uh, I think especially Ian Clark is very good about making the extended technique pieces um, melodic, which is something that once you get towards a lot more of the extreme extended technique pieces, a lot of them start to become more textural, which might be a little bit uh, harder to approach for the normal uh, kind of canonized classical Western listener. Um, so I thought Beverly kind of helped bridge that gap of being melodic uh, while still having those bamboo tones and experimenting with those extended techniques. Yeah, and I think he primarily uses only like one or two sounds and it's mostly just multiphonic. So you're, you're, you're getting used to just kind of like, or, or alternate fingerings, you're just getting used to kind of the one or two techniques. Whereas like Jacob said, it's not multi-layered, so you're not overwhelmed. And then a third piece would be Honami by Will Offermans. Um, that wouldn't be like the first I would use. That'd be like maybe the third that I would put a student on. Okay, more questions, because I know Juan's hand went up. Justin, what do we have? <clears throat> uh, Juan didn't type a question. So Juan, if you want to chime in. Um, I guess my question is more about um, in the approach of a piece and and working with working on a piece with a mentor. I remember when uh, you and I were learning. Uh, I was learning icicle, and you and I were working on it. And in a, in a piece like that, which um, it, it was written so early, that extended technique notation wasn't really clear. How would you approach um, marking it and 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 making sure that everything is clear, so that when you do return to the piece in the future? everything is 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 kind of set and kind of easy to jump back in yeah and i think like i am laughing because didn't it take me a while i kept saying like ask me for the ask me for my score i've got all the notes somewhere did i ever get it to you or did i bring it eventually yeah i believe so yeah so the thing is like with pieces like icicle which i think are like that piece for me was really hard to decipher um and 
there are many, uh, Tor Takamitsu's voice is another one. It's like, what does any of this mean? You know, he, he uses like number, a numbering system for the fingers. And you're like, well, what exactly is one and what's four? Is this a piano one or is it flute one? Or like what finger is, you know, um, and it's very unclear. And so first of all, I'd like to answer your question, Juan, by saying that the way to tackle that, and it takes so much time. And Juan actually just last night performed um, Will Offerman's Tsuro Tsunogamori, which is like a really complicated extended technique piece. And I just remember the first time I learned that piece, even though the notation is very clear, I spent a lot of time like listening with my earplugs shoved into my, my earphones, put deeply into my ears and like kept rewinding things and trying to figure out very clearly like what the sound was that I was hearing. Um, so the first step is to, you know, find some good recordings. If you can find the composer playing the piece or the person who premiered the piece, hoping that they worked with the composer. Um, and, you know, and, and even in the case where the piece is clearly marked, you're still going to have to do that work where you listen and you try to figure out what you're hearing. Um, but to answer your question, Juan, once you've deciphered it, because it takes so many hours, and by the way, I need to give you this, the same thing for the Will Offerman's. I have my version of that deciphered piece with all my notes. Then you want to create a clean copy. So you make a brand new copy. Never mark on your original copies. As soon as you get an original score, make multiple photocopies of it. Tuck the original away. Don't even look at it again for a long time. And start working off of these copies, you know, because then eventually the copy is going to get so uh, filled with notes that you won't even be able to look at it anymore. And then it's time to move off of that copy and move to the next copy and just drag the most important notes over. But in terms of what Juan's asking about, you wanna reserve one copy for where you can mark things. Now, the thing is some scores don't have a lot of space, like there's some space here, and, but there is no space here. So in terms of how to mark it, one thing that I like to do, Juan, is I like to put in all the fingerings in the score if they're not marked like this. Um, I'll put it in with markers, like make the dots myself, or there's a stamp, there's actually a flute stamp that you can get and it's really cool, there's a mini version of it. And I'll stamp all of the music with this cute little flute fingering stamp, it's only like $12.95 and you can get it at Flute World. And then that way it's neat and clean and I can mark in all of the fingerings. Then the other second thing that I like to do is use a numbering system. So I'll have like, I'll put a one here, a two here, a three here, a four here, and on another piece of paper, and I think I did this for the Will Offermans. Um, I know I did it for uh, Shirish Corday's um, piece, Nesting Cranes, which is more like one of the hardest, most complicated flute extended technique pieces. But on a separate paper, you have the one, and then anything and everything that you've like discovered or learned or figured out about how it works, my flute works better at this angle, you put all of that on that separate piece of paper. And then you take it and you staple it like 5,000 times because you're gonna pray that that paper never becomes dislodged <laughs> from your score because all of your gold is on that paper. Um, and then if you're gonna teach the piece, Hopefully you have it in an organized location so you can just pull it out and hand your student a copy. Um, any other questions so far? Okay, so this, this is just an example of the score. And now um, let me move this over. Okay, so let's go into um talking about some of the sounds okay first i want to talk about and and then i'm going to ask after i do this introduction i'm going to ask you to ask me which ones you want me to do next okay we're going to go in the order that you guys pick but i'd like to start with the head joint because this one gets me very excited so every time i teach a master class <clears throat> or a workshop on extended techniques and you know often 
um, it, when it's in person, the room is filled with people who have like fright, but delight on their faces. You know, you can almost see it. It's like they're holding their flutes and they're wondering what's going to happen, you know, because people who come to those workshops are interested, they're afraid, but they don't, you know, they don't know. So they're, they're newbies, right? They're novices at these techniques. So the thing that I love to start with is the head joint, because this also is a great way to get kids involved. Um, and it's just a matter of kind of breaking down this barrier concept of this, these extended techniques being something to be afraid of and um, helping us realize that it's really fun and it's just part of the flute. And so I often start with just the very simple that you can make that kind of a sound. Um, I also will put my hands on the end of the instrument. This is my favorite one. And, and I see Juan smiling, you know, like it's so much fun and the whole room lights up and people start to like relax. They're like, oh, I think this is gonna be a fun class, right? Because who doesn't like that sound? great sound to make and then people try it and then I move into kind of airy sounds just like so again we're sort of taking the neurology of all those thousands of hours of practice that we've had where we've trained ourselves to play you know de la sonorite with this perfect flute sound and instead we're just kind of breaking it down and telling our brain it's okay to have this silver thing on your face and not be creating this perfect sound. So we move into exploration um, and then an articulated version of the air sound. Just getting our brain comfortable with hearing sounds like that come out of the instrument. And then eventually what I like to do, especially with kids, and if I'm teaching one-on-one -on -one and I'm introducing my young kids to um, extended techniques, I'll give them an assignment to go home and create a piece with the extended techniques that we've explored um, just with the head joint and text. So now these nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds are going home with the head joint, which is something they can manage, right? Without all their fingers involved. And their assignment is to come back and, you know, say, once upon a time in a dark, dark forest, there was a wind. And from the distant distance, the sound of a horse's footsteps. And then a ghost. You know, and they come back with these beautiful stories. And, you know, basically they've spent a week like becoming friends with the head joint. Like you're gonna need to be friends with the head joint eventually, right? So it's just a great way to work. It's a great way to keep it fun. Um, and again, it's all about breaking down these fear barriers and, and you know, uh, exploration. Because the main thing when you're working with extended techniques is you have to be in a mindset of willingness to explore. It's not about perfection, it's about discovery. Okay, so that's my little introduction on the head joint. And now I'd like to have a suggestion for what extended technique you'd like me to address. Or you can put it in the chat and Dustin can set up an order. And here are some of the lists. So we have key clicks, timbral trills, lip bends, Vocalized sounds like beatboxing, um, tongue pizzicato, all that stuff. Do we have anything yet, Dustin? Yeah, we have um, shaking vibrato, jet whistle, throat flutter tonguing, whistle tones, micro tones. Okay, that's a good start. So we'll just yeah. go in that order. So shaking vibrato is kind of like not really a thing. Um, who, I'm curious who put that down. Juan. Yeah, I was wondering if it was Juan. Okay, because it's really more of a shakuhachi uh, technique. And so it isn't really um, like codified yet in terms of like um, flute extended techniques. Although um, <clears throat> I think Eftihia has it in her doctoral dissertation because she created a whole 
uh, list of extended techniques. And so it's in there, but it's really not that common yet, Juan. Um, and in terms of what it is, basically when you watch a shakuhachi player play, and some of these techniques are based off of indigenous instruments or in instruments of other cultures. So that's what's great about it. You have Western art music composers hearing these sounds and wanting to bring them to the Western uh, you know, classical flute. And so uh, the best way to approach figuring them out is to go listen to those instruments. Like if you're hearing bamboo tones, well, what does a bamboo flute sound like? In terms of specifically, Juan, what you're talking about, uh, it's when you're, you, the vibrato gets so fast that you can't actually make it go faster, right? And by the way, to create that sound, I was using laryngeal vibrato. I wasn't, ha, 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 ha. I wasn't engaging the abdominal wall to in a fluttering way to get that fast vibrato, but I'm limited. I can only go, I can only be, a nanny goat to a certain speed and uh, frequency and velocity. So in order to get this faster sound, you actually take the flute and you shake it. Actually, I'll stop screen sharing so that you can see better. I see people kind of moving into the screen. Um, all right, so hopefully you can all see me better now. Um, so basically, and I noticed this in your playing last night, Juan, and I hope to address it in lesson this week. But if you, I've learned that if you navigate shaking the flute with the left hand, you're gonna get too much movement here. And so the airstream is being kind of jostled and you're actually moving the lips so much that the airstream gets cut off from the flute. So when I learned that piece, Juan, and I encountered that technique, I found that using the right hand to kind of just using the right hand to shake the flute was really helpful. Yeah, and if you have your flutes, you can try it. So you can take like an F so that you're stable and then take your right hand and just and as you're listening to yourself on your end, if you feel like your sound is chopping in and out because uh, the lip, the, enter, the uh, embouchure hole is moving too much, then you're gonna wanna modify the movement so that it's not too wide. You're just gonna wanna get a shake going, um, but you're also going to wanna be primarily focused in terms of what you're listening for to the sensation of the air uh, being consistent because part of what you're asking your body to do, which is very unique, it doesn't have any context for this, is to have this lip plate be moving and your airstream still be caught. And you can see that if I move it a lot, I'm going to run into problems because I'm missing it. So the goal is how much movement can I have and still maintain the and eventually you find it's not a lot. It has to be a micro movement, but fast. And that's where I find the right hand, probably because of its location in terms of your arm, to be the better arm to shake than the left hand. Because this one is just like so macro and so close to the lip. So to answer your question, Juan, I would say, and we'll work on it this week, just a little bit of a shimmer in the right hand. Okay, what's the next one, uh, Dustin? Jet whistle. Okay, jet whistle, I love this. First of all, I'll, demo, I'll demonstrate a jet whistle. And my joke is that normally if I have to do this in a piece, the first thing I do is I burn incense to the gods of the jet whistle because you never know if a jet whistle is gonna come out. You know, and it's like, and, and that's the thing about extended techniques and like you have to be such a courageous flutist to do this music. I mean, anything we do takes courage, but you know, you just have no guarantee that some of these things are gonna come out. Multiphonics is another example. Like if I suddenly wanna, you know, do one, I kind of have to like remember where it is and find it. And I have to be okay with the imperfection of that. 
because there is like a crassness and a kind of more of an imperfection um, with dealing with some of these techniques. There's a greater uh, percentage of uh, error and, and risk involved. So the first thing I do is I burn incense to the gods of the jet whistle. And I'm like, I hope you favor me today and give me a great jet whistle. That's step number one. Step number two, here's how I break it down when I teach it. Um, and then I'll talk about how to modify that breakdown uh, once you've become more advanced at it or when, if you find your student is struggling with it. So typically when I teach a jet whistle, I um, break it down into three steps. The first step is I have the student put their arm, cover the lip plate, and so you're almost like you're, you're going like this and the lip plate goes here not like this and you'll get 50 maybe 70 percent of students will go like this and that does not work okay so you really have to double check to make sure they have like fish lips like because when you go to rotate out you need those lips to be over the hole if you if you approach covering the lip plate like this with the lips rolled in when you go to do the whistle, it won't work. Okay, so you wanna double check this in yourself and in your students, the lips go out. So you say fish lips, and then you wanna set up what, what I call a hinge. So you wanna think about like what a door hinge looks like and what a door hinge does. So you've got this positioning where one arm is up and the other arm goes up. So if you look at the angle that you're watching from the video and, and the camera here, You'll see that like the flute is like the hinge in a door jam. And my arms are like the door, right? And what I'm not doing is this. I'm not going up, down, up, down, up, down. I'm setting up an angle here and I'm maintaining the angle. So this is correct for this part of the teaching. And this is not correct. This is gonna run you into a lot of problems. You don't wanna yank just one arm up and have the other arm underneath. So you set up kind of like a right angle-ish sort of hinge. And that's really hard. I think um, probably 80% of the people really struggle with that. Like you have to kind of put your hands on the student and point out that one arm is going up like a chicken and, and get, you know, get our body maps organized because it's not a movement we ever do. I mean, nobody walks around like doing this. Okay, yeah, and you can try it with a pencil in front of you now or just anything that you have, just your air flutes. So your lip plates are covered with your lips. You have a hinge going. Step two is to blow into the instrument and say, hui. Okay, this is really important. I think if there's one thing that guarantees a great jet whistle, it's what you do with your oral cavity. Um, and it's not often taught. It's not often um, something that we're aware of, maybe because it's inside. And, you know, we're like, wow, they have a great jet whistle. How, how is their jet whistle so good? Well, maybe they don't even know that they're actually alternating the oral cavity. But that's the trick. So everybody for a moment just go, hooey, hooey. And notice what your tongue is doing. Hooey, hooey. You'll probably feel it go up against your molars. Hooey, and you'll feel it widen out. And what that does is it changes the shape of the air. Okay? So now we have, and you can have the student just practice the hooey without the hinge. Just. <sighs> Hopefully you can hear there's a who and an e in there, can you? Okay, which is kind of a cool thing. Can you imagine that you actually can hear the shape of my mouth in my flute? That's pretty profound, okay? So hui, hui, hui. Then you put the two together, okay? And currently the air is just stable. There's no acceleration of airspeed. Um, you're simply now doing who e and you're going to coordinate the e with the out motion okay by the way this is the hardest extended technique to teach um, and you can see why it's just so broken down 
So you've got the who and the e. So it goes like this. So you can try that on your air flutes. Who we? Who we? Who we? Good and Shayla. Make sure that that back arm is coming up. It kind of looks like you're doing the front arm thing that I see a lot of people do. We want this whole structure to move. It's not just one arm. If anybody else, yeah. Okay, Paul, that looks really good. Um, and nice job, Anne. Good, all right, there's that tricky part. Like that's why you have to keep your eye out on this whole arm thing. Because listen to the difference. I'll play a jet whistle with just this arm moving and I'll play a jet whistle with the, the entire hinge thing going. Here's the first one. Did you hear that? Was that hearable? Okay, here's the second one. So like A or B? Well, obviously, right? B. And you can't get that kind of momentum and you can't get the distance of travel if you're stuck on one arm. So hooey is step two, all right? So now we have this sort of movement, we've explored it, we're now thinking about hooey. And step three is to increase the velocity of the air. So for that, you can just take a finger or your hand and go So it should move from like warm to freezing. And really get your student to like feel the temperature of the breath on their hand. In fact, just in general, that's a beautiful thing to do. Like, wow, you can change the temperature of the air on your hand. It's pretty beautiful. And now try it with hui. Okay, hurdles here. And then I probably should move on um, and, and kind of like at least tackle three or four other extended techniques. Hurdles here are that you'll have some students who can't access or don't know how to access this sudden increase in breath speed. And the answer really is in the abdominal wall because what you're doing is you're compressing the abdominal wall so that it pushes up against the viscera, which then pushes up against the diaphragm, which then pushes the air out of the lungs. Okay, so then you're gonna put it together and this becomes extra fun. And this is just a matter of over and over again. And then celebrating when it's a good one. So I'll just, I'll just demonstrate three or four. And I want you to hear how each one sounds completely different because I did not burn incense to the gods of the, of the jet whistle this morning, but I am friends with them. So some of them might come out, um, but each one is different just depending on, you know, how I set things up. Like that was a good one because it had that slice. And the reason it had that is the first time I did it, I was kind of rolled. I didn't have enough uh, angle on my flute. And I knew to then bring the angle back and find a different dimension. And then it's a matter of changing the length and the shape and the arc and the timing of that. And that's just a creative process thing. Okay, Dustin, what were some of the other top ones? Um, we had whistle tones, microtones, uh, tongue pizzicato. Okay, let's, uh, Tina, I see that you asked for permission to record, sorry, um, but you can, you can download it off of YouTube or Dustin can send you the link if you want. Um, okay, let's, I think whistle tones, it's a little, probably, we're gonna jump to easier things just because of time. I wanna get through more extended techniques. So tongue pizzicato, a great way to teach this is with rice, okay? Or like little sesame seeds or something, you know? And I, I know you can't really do that with COVID now, like ask your students to spit rice across the room, but you can ask them to go home and spit rice across the room and just take a little bowl of rice, put it on the tip of their tongue and explain that what they wanna to try to just get the, the, the rice to go as far as possible. 
Um, I mean, how fun would it be to have a teacher who wants you to go home with a head joint, come back with like a horror, you know, like, and then like take rice and spit it across your lawn, right? Flute playing is fun. So we're going to make all this really fun for everybody. Uh, but what that does is basically they're setting up pressure between the tongue and the lips. <laughs> In fact, over there on your own, you can even try imagining you have rice on your tongue. And to really get that rice to go far, once again, you have to have, um, your abdominal wall has to give a kick. And it's coordinated with the tongue and the lips, the lips being pressurized against the tongue. And then all you do is add the flute. And then you put a melody to it. And then it's a matter of refining it from there. Okay, another one, Dustin. We had throat flutter tonguing, but I guess both flutter tonguing. Yeah, so um, who asked that question? Sammy did. Hi, Sammy. Hi, I struggle with teaching the throat because I'm so, I naturally can do it with my tongue, so. Yeah, so first let's clarify um, just better terminology um, because it's, it's not actually done in the throat, okay? So physiologically, officially, the throat is like the larynx down. It's like more of the passageway of where like air and food would go, kind of the esophagus area. Um, and actually the quote unquote throat flutter tonguing does not occur there. It occurs, if you, if you can think about those cartoons where someone's screaming, ah! And that little thing is hanging down and wiggling. Do we know what we're talking about here? That is called the uvula. So actually, it's really the soft palate. It's that, and the uvula hangs down from the soft area of the top of your, um, you know, your oral pharynx is the appropriate terminology for the location. Um, and so everyone take the tip of your tongue and tap it on the roof of your mouth. And notice that your tongue is hitting a bone. Right? Now go farther back. And you can use the back of your tongue even and go wah, 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 wah. And notice that the back of your tongue is hitting like not a bone. Wah, 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 wah. And if you can't find that, say honk honk that n k part honk the tongue is up against the soft palate that is how uvicular flutter tonguing is produced sammy a uvicular flutter tonguing is the proper terminology right it, it sounds kind of like yeah i want that i want to be able to do that so um and so the best way to teach it i think this is the way i always start with is to tell the student because this has humor, to take a moment to get in touch with their inner sixth grade self, right? Go back to when you were in sixth grade and your parents ask you to do something you don't want to do. And you go, oh, no. So everybody try that. Just go, oh, no. <laughs> that thing. That is the beginning of your uvicular flutter tonguing. So then you just suspend it. You'd be like, no way. Uh -uh. And there it is. <laughs> Does that work, Sammy? <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. It's so much easier than what I was trying to explain. How are you? explain that you take your soft palate and you put air behind it and you make it wiggle now you just kind of like try to access it through something that people naturally do and I think everybody can make the <sighs> sound okay another one Dustin or a couple more give me like a few to select from um 
<laughs> Juan says tongue ram. <laughs> for uh, key clicks. Okay. That's pretty All right, let's talk about but... key clicks first because that's a quick and easy one. Um, basically, if you have Strawbringer pads, you're going to have the most amazing key clicks on the planet because they're so loud. <laughs> so I just want to plug for that. Not that I play with Strawbringer pads, but like people who have those uh, pads on their fleet, like their key clicks are like really amazing. Um, <clears throat> the main thing to think about with the key clicks, first of all, it does not damage your flute. The only thing that's going to really damage your flute is if you take these anything with these bars and you sh you move the bars around like this, okay? And there is no extended technique that requires you to take these delicate bars and shove them up and down. So I just want to dispel this uh, notion that, and I've had people like actually say, well, your flute must be in awful condition because you play extended techniques and it's not true i mean if you're putting a finger down for a multiphonic or you're putting a finger down for a regular f it's not destroying your flute if your technique is beautiful and your technique should always be beautiful um, you know and so the touch is light and it's close and all that so whether you're playing multiphonics or timbral trills <laughs> I'm still using a very beautiful light technique and a touch. Um, and the things that you do internally, they don't affect your flute. So don't get me started on that whole thing. I know I got myself started on it, but the idea is just to make sure that you know that you're not really damaging your flute. Um, with key clicks, maybe that's the closest you, you get to potentially damaging your flute. But again, if you're, if you're doing these things correctly, you're not. Um, if you're not cleaning your pads or if you're scraping paper through your pads as you're cleaning them, you're doing way more damage to the flute than if you do key clicks. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that the main thing about key clicks is that most people don't know unless they're taught is that regardless of any note that you're supposed to play that's below like G, you always want to be clicking the G key. So if I play an F, I'm not going to kick click the F key. I'm not kick clicking the lowest key in the sequence of fingers that are placed down. I'm kick clicking the G key. And I want you to listen to the difference. So I'm going to, I'm going to finger a D and I'm going to click this. And then I'm going to click the G key and see if you can hear the difference. Yeah, it's like epically different. So you run into problems with key clicks when you go above G because the tube gets shorter. So, you know, you don't have that depth and you don't have that central location. And the hardest key click to do is a C one because it's like, you can't get the sound out, right? I mean, it's, it's a very really light sound. So if you're not, if you're recording, it's no problem. But if you're in a concert hall, and I have a C key click, what I like to do is fake it a little bit. And I like to kind of, I actually do a light tongue pizzicato because that produces the quality of the key click. And there's a, a place in one of Robert Dick's pieces where I like to do that. Um, and it trans, translates as a key click, um, but it's not. Okay. Um, we have about five minutes till four, just letting you know. Thank you, Justin. I was going to say one more thing about key clicks. Ah, the other thing I want to say about key clicks, it's really fascinating, is that depending on where you place the flute, the sound of the key click changes. So watch this. Watch the shape of my mouth and listen to how the sound changes. Isn't that interesting? So it's kind of like co-resonance. Um, so think about that. Okay, what was the other extended technique that I said I would do next? Oh, tongue ram, right? <clears throat> okay, this one's really hard to teach because um, 
and I'm remembering Eftihia right now because, and she'll be okay with me sharing this, but we like had so many lessons on tongue rings. Uh, it's just really hard because everything's hidden. And Emily hooked us up with a great tongue ram last night. So, right, Emily, wherever, there you are. Yeah, she played a, a piece that had one at the concert last night. So what's, I think the hardest thing to teach about the tongue ram is that you can't show the student really what you're doing. Um, the closest you can get, and I'm talking mostly about what the tongue does, is to make the sound and pull your flute away. And then I'll go, I'll go ahead and demonstrate the breakdown for teaching it. But first, let me show you this. So you would then make the sound. And then you pull your flute away and be like, that's where it goes. So what's actually happening in a tongue ram is you're clogging up the hole, the embouchure hole with your tongue. And where the confusion and the challenge comes in for people is in how they clog a hole up. Some people like will tighten up their tongue and point it and kind of stick it in the hole and that doesn't work very well. And you can't see what they're doing because it's hard to see. And when they pull their flutes away, they may have moved their tongue. So just remember the trick of like, let's see if you can make the sound and pull your flute away without changing your location so that I can analyze and see where you're placing your tongue. Okay, so how to break it down for a student. The first thing is to, I would say, start with the fish lip thing because you have to be like this and not like that. And you will have maybe 60% of your students will kind of want to go, they'll want to eat the head joint like, and you could say, you know, eat like you're going to eat your head joint or kiss your head joint or be a fish lip on your head joint but you really want this opening, okay? And then the second step is to have the breath velocity discussion. So that's like, bah, bah. In fact, you can just say, bah, on your side of the screen there. Bah, and vocalizing it's helpful because you can actually hear the increase in the velocity of the airstream when they're doing that. And then the third step is to stop that. But, 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 and then take the voice away. And then from there, it's a question of what color, and this is like super, you know, final version. What, what color, what quality do you want the tongue ram to have? Because in certain cases, you can get the tongue and the breath to work together in such a way that most of what you hear is like the clogging of the sound. For example. And how you navigate all those pieces determines like the quality of that sound. Okay, it's four o'clock, but I'll stay for one minute longer if we have one more. Is there like a desperate, I really want to learn? Tina, you're smiling. Do you have one? <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, okay, let me close by showing you my new favorite extended technique, okay? And then I won't tell you how I'm doing it. So we'll just all be left with this like, big fat question all right isn't that a fun way to end the class <laughs> all right here's my favorite extended technique that's it <laughs> Okay, thank you for your attention. And again, this will be up on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. And I think you can download it from there if you wanna have <clears throat> actual access to it. Um, and I hope that the takeaway is be afraid, but be courageous. Okay, there's nothing wrong with fear.
it's a great opportunity to exercise your courage muscle. And remember that with extended techniques, you have to, it's all about exploration and that's what's great about it, okay? And thirdly, please don't be one of those teachers, if you wouldn't mind, who puts it on such a pedestal that you're denying access <clears throat> or the opportunity to explore to your youngest, most beginner flutist because they're really great at making those sounds, okay? And so thanks for joining today and hopefully we'll see you at the next class. Bye everybody.